Thank you so much for coming this morning. Mm -hmm. And uh, thank you to Atlantic Council to invite me and to moderate this discussion because it's my great honor and the pleasure and the, I don't know, to, to moderate in this uh, distinguished <coughs> panel. And uh, thank you to Ambassador John Herbst organizing and having this flagship program on frontline states because for Georgia, Ukraine, and Moldova, I mean, uh, Western support is, uh, support is a crucial one. And um, uh, I think that the uh, main issue on this regard uh, covered by Kurt and the Professor Blocking today and the historical overview of uh, what is going with this gray zones and the future of the past, uh, where we now. And so introducing this panel, uh, especially the ambassador Kurt Walker, uh, as an executive director of the McCain Institute for International Leadership and also US special representative uh, for Ukraine negotiations. Uh, I would like to go to uh, Kurt with the first question. Uh, that um, could you tell us more about where we stand now with the Ukraine negotiations? Because I saw your interview with the uh, Russian media company, with the Echo Moskvi. Mm -hmm. you, you are talking about the, what is going now there. And then I saw the uh, reflection of the uh, like uh, Putin's regime, people saying that uh, it uh, exceeds your mandate or whatever. And uh, uh, tell us what you've seen, why Russians are so mad at you. Well, I think the Russians don't like having people point out what they're doing. Uh, so I think that's one of the main reasons that you see this kind of pushback. Another is that I think their principal objective at this point, you know, and, and it's, you know, it's fluid, uh, is to um, get the two people's republics ensconced permanently. Uh, just as they did with Abkhazia and South Ossetian governments. And uh, by pointing out that that is contrary to the Minsk agreements, um, that the Minsk agreements say that the territory is to be restored to Ukrainian sovereignty, and that there is no place for these entities under the Ukrainian constitution, is something that really goes directly against what Russia is trying to accomplish. And so I think that's one of the main reasons. Another reason that I'll have to say is that I think the Russians still harbor an illusion that uh, there is somehow some savior for them in President Trump, that he has an administration that is, has put in place much tougher policies on Russia and much more support for Ukraine than the previous administration. And I think they're just still hoping somehow that this doesn't really reflect President Trump and he's going to change it. Uh, I, I can assure everyone that's not true, <laughs> that uh, everything that has been done, everything I just mentioned in my remarks here, had been approved by President Trump. Uh, so it is not as if this is an administration running around him. Uh, I think this is President Trump authorizing an administration to build a position of strength. Mm -hmm. Because again, the goal is to have a peaceful solution. You know, the goal was not to just have sanctions in place against Russia. The goal is to have Ukraine's territory and sovereignty restored and to have safety and security for all Ukrainian people again. Yeah. But uh, still, I, I'm going to follow up questions that uh, we understand that the, from U.S. government, uh, Ukraine is like uh, getting a lot of support on this regard. But uh, still, the willingness of the Russia uh, to be like a constructive negotiator and uh, your counterpart Surkov. I mean, what what's the future? What's the next step? You you know well, how we're going to forward go forward? Or yeah. <laughs> So um, Vladislav Surkov and I have been trading a few messages over the course of the summer and fall. Um, essentially trying to come back to the question is with the logjam that we have, where Russia is saying Ukraine is not doing enough to fulfill the Minsk agreements, and the Ukrainians are saying, yeah, but we can't because Russia is occupying the territory. How can we have elections when there's no freedom of movement and no security, for example? And a special status is supposed to take effect after election, or on the day of elections, not before. So don't tell us we haven't done special status when we can't do it. So you have this logjam where e neither side feels that it can move. 
So we have proposed the um, deployment of a UN mandated peacekeeping mission to create security in eastern Ukraine, uh, see the disbandment of the uh, illegal armed groups and militias and containment of heavy weapons, and that would then create the conditions where you could have elections and get on with things. So that's what we've been proposing, and that has support from Ukraine, from Germany, from France, from uh, European Union, and so forth. Uh, the Russians have said, no, 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 we can't do that. Uh, we can do a protection force for the UN monitors, and then let's see how that goes. And uh, maybe, maybe we could uh, dis discuss more later if needed. Uh, which is basically a recipe for freezing the conflict in place. So uh, none of the groups that I just mentioned, US, Ukraine, <laughs> Germany, France, etc., sees any merit in that kind of proposal. We suggested a way to bridge the concepts. You can start small, but then grow. And the Russians are still not really willing to discuss that either. Uh, so we've been trading messages back and forth. I think uh, it's probably about time we get back together again and talk through it. Although, uh, as I indicated, I'm rather pessimistic about uh, Russia's willingness to, to move at all at this point. Is going to happen soon? Or? Well, we don't have a date or anything. We'll, we'll keep trading notes and come up with something. Great. May I have a question to you? Sure. Mr. Blocking. Uh, I'd like to ask you, uh, because we all know the, how the Russians are like uh, using our internal vulnerabilities, you know, to against us. And uh, in Georgia or in Ukraine, they have like a say, same scenario. And um, what should we do or what Ukraine should do better, you know, to resist to this pressure, mm -hmm. in your opinion? Well, uh, this is an excellent question. And uh, Ukraine turned out to be absolutely unprepared to what happened. Even people couldn't imagine that, that there can be a, a, a military conflict. Uh, now it's not difficult anymore. People, people live with that on a daily basis. So what Ambassador uh, Volker was saying that Ukraine today is much more unified than it used to be, certainly in the last 20, 25 years, since 1991. But the problems, the problems remain still. And one of them is the question of the potential fault lines within Ukraine. Uh, linguistic differences, cultural differences, different parts of Ukraine uh, belong to different states and empires over the period of, of uh, time. And that what was certainly very successfully exploited in the case of Crimea and less successfully in the case, from the Russian point of view, in the case of uh, Donbass. But uh, that led to uh, really consequences that probably few people could predict, and certainly people in Kremlin couldn't predict. Ukraine became much more consolidated. First of all, the, uh, theoretically, the most pro-Russian regions are now not part of the government-controlled territory. That means they don't take part, the people who live on that territory don't take part in the elections. For the first time in Ukraine, partially because of the loss of territories, partially because of the mobilization against the Russian aggression, you have a strong majority. Uh, for the first time in Ukrainian history, a president was elected in the, first, in the first round of elections. We'll see what will happen now. And we see the emergence of the, of the new minority, or potentially new minority, that wasn't there before. Ukraine was 50-50 in terms of pro-Western, pro-Eastern part. Now the pro-Western part and culturally more Ukrainian part is dominant one. And Russians really become, or culturally Russian, potentially on the way of becoming a minority. And that is uh, the, the task, th this is the challenge, uh, in one of many challenges in front of today's government in terms of the cultural policy, linguistic policies, when it comes to the recent crisis uh, uh, over Orthodox Church and autocephaly, to be aware of and take care of, because again, uh, Russia is there to take advantages of whatever tensions they can find. Uh, I'm going to follow up question as well, because I mean, uh, do you think that the, uh, Ukraine, as well as Georgia, they're doing like uh, well uh, or doing enough uh, to move forward to the like uh, uh, NATO strategy or to working on a NATO membership agenda? Because in terms of Georgia, it's like a different situation. We have like uh, explored more 
like advantages from this. But uh, in Ukraine, what is going? Because as I understand, uh, even the membership of Georgia, it's not going to happen without Ukraine. Or membership of Ukraine, it's not going to happen without Georgia. And if we are going to like uh, have this battle uh, shoulder to shoulder, then uh, how long it takes to move forward? I mean to do this kind of reform agenda quickly. Otherwise, uh, uh, we see that how Russians are using this and uh, weakening our institutions. And the weak institutions cannot uh, like uh, fight against the uh, Russian influence or Russian interfere. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, what is going on in this regard uh, in Ukraine at this stage? Yeah, well, mm, I, I can't predict future. I have trouble predicting <laughs> the past. <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, still, <laughs> future is <laughs> important. The, the, there is an interesting development in Ukraine as the result of that war and that mobilization. So the the parliament voted to put NATO membership in the in the constitution. And uh, 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 NATO, NATO skeptics are now actually jumping on the NATO bandwagon. You, you go, yesterday I was going to the uh, Borispil airport in Kiev and you see big boards there. Yulia Tymoshenko is saying that the future of Ukraine is in European Union and the security of Ukraine is in NATO. And this is coming from the politician who wasn't known really exactly for, for sympathy toward NATO. So now it's the, the, com the, 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 the there is a political consensus, or as close to get as you can get in Ukraine uh, ar around NATO, uh, to a degree that people try to to, to overbid them e each other and, and and prove who is who is more pro NATO, which is interesting, and uh, that that is a sea change really. Mm -hmm. Before that, the, you you wanted to be elected, you wanted to be the president, you try to actually stay as far away from that question as possible. That change. The question is what will happen with the new elections, and and uh, how how serious this. Uh, statements that are made now will become but there is a major change mm -hmm. thank you so much for your answer and i would like to go to back to court because he is like a long-standing friend of georgia and mine as well and i'm very privileged uh, with his friendship and uh, i mean still you know in our countries we are facing such a like a challenges that all our governments, as you mentioned this, or the politicians are declaring that they are pro-NATO or pro-Western values and so, but acting very differently and very weirdly, <laughs> in a weird way. Mm -hmm. And what is uh, what you suggest or recommendation, what country like uh, Ukraine or Georgia doing to uh, get more support from the uh, transatlantic unity because this support is not unified yet I think so mm -hmm. it's maybe US I mean I'm sure that the US is supporting and their uh, US is our strategic partners and other many countries but this is not unify how to say support among transatlantics and are they like uh, understood this situation enough or we're not doing something well mm -hmm. <laughs> how it works. Well, it's very hard to sit in the West these days and tell other countries how they should act. <laughs> <laughs> but still, as a friendly advice. <laughs> you know. um, but, oh, so I, I think I, w think of NATO as a framework, a useful framework, a good framework that is a reflection of um, uh, how countries have organized themselves uh, both for democracy and prosperity and security. It, it's a reflection of that. Whether or not a country is a member of NATO, the society should be demanding and, and voting for people and bringing about change. It's going to produce solid democratic institutions, peaceful changes of government, responsible um, leadership, um, uh, fighting corruption, prosperity, attracting foreign investment, integration with the rest of the world, um, capacities so that it is a resilient and secure country generally. These are all things that Georgia needs to do, Ukraine needs to do, Moldova, everybody needs to do these things. 
If you do those things, you put yourself in the best possible position to be welcomed as a member of NATO because you're not a burden, you're an asset. Uh, you, you, you help build security for a wider community. And the title of this conference um, is a reflection of, of that big idea that we ought to be trying to build a world where everybody, <laughs> everybody is free and lives in a democratic society. They have opportunities for economic uh, success and they feel secure and they don't have to worry about losing their land or their lives or their grandchildren's prosperity to others. So I think that's the way to think of it in terms of, of what to work on. Now, in terms of the institutions and the decision making around NATO, uh, it is one fundamental thing is very important to make clear. Uh, Russia continues to have a mindset that it has a right to have a say over other countries. Like it, it should be able to decide what happens to Georgia or what happens to Ukraine. The, the West, including the U.S., has exactly the opposite perspective. We think these countries should decide for themselves what it is they want and build that and we can be their friends and supporters uh, to help them achieve what they want. It is a fundamentally different approach and we want to see Ukraine and Georgia and others be successful that way. Uh, another is that uh, NATO was founded in 1949 as a defensive alliance. Uh, that the, the only thing that glues NATO together for security is an attack on one is considered to be an attack on all. That's not aggression, it's not encirclement, it's not a threat, it is a defense. And that's important, it was very successful throughout the Cold War that NATO had the commitment and then developed the means to make that idea of defense real. I think that is still a valid idea. I, I, I will say, of course, NATO has done other things. It, it, uh, it helps stop the war in Bosnia, it helps stop the war in Kosovo. Uh, but then what? It turns into a peacekeeping mission under a UN mandate and NATO draws down and countries get on with things. Uh, in the case of Georgia or Ukraine, I, I think it would be a mistake to create uh, a, a policy or a fact that if Russia chooses to occupy part of another country's territory, that NATO then can't do anything and, and this, uh, that country is ineligible for NATO. Mm -hmm. I think as long as we are viewing it as a defensive alliance and preventing further aggression, that we would be prepared to re respond to further aggression but not launch aggression, then I think we should also be able to be in a position where we can say the fact that Russia occupies part of your territory is not alone a disqualifying thing. Now, countries have a lot of other things they have to do, and I would, I would let's take Ukraine. I think there's, there's a long way before Ukraine starts looking like a NATO member. But I think we should be welcoming of the aspirations and trying to help countries develop the right way so that at some point in the future, it can become a reality. Thank you. Maybe I will ask to our audience also to get some questions because I'm not going to bother with my questions anymore. But Please introduce yourself and ask the questions, not the statements, please. <laughs> so, no, Hello, I'm Maxim Kulikov from Kyiv based in Tank, East European Security Research Initiative Foundation, and my question will be to Mr. Walker. Uh, so now we see in Ukraine the signs of uh, another deterioration situation in the East. Uh, Russia has scheduled uh, illegal uh, so-called elections uh, uh, for the occupied territories for November 11th. Uh, we see that the OEC monitors uh, notes uh, the acceleration of uh, arms supplies from Russia. A lot of uh, military trucks crossing the border, and uh, just yesterday uh, the Russian State Duma, uh, Russian Parliament issued a statement uh, with direct threats to Ukraine. Uh, the, uh, they uh, promised Ukraine the, so to say, adequate answer and uh, catastrophic consequences for its uh, politics. 
So maybe it's all uh, in the context of this Ukraine's moving towards the independent church. And uh, we know that Russia prepares some uh, acts of violence, or uh, dis uh, disorders in Ukraine, uh, and may it be used as a pretext to further deterioration in Donbass, to maybe a new advance. Uh, what do you think about it? And uh, uh, what we can expect uh, as a response of the West if such uh, things happen? Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you. you. Well, a couple of things, you, you raised a lot of points. One of them is um, y you do see some of those factors on the ground that you mentioned. Thus far, they are still all in the same framework we've been in for about four years. Uh, Russia having command and control and substantial forces in the east, resupply, troop rotation, exercising, firing, you know, it's all the, nothing substantially different from the way it has been. Uh, I don't think Russia is going to launch a new ground attack and try to take more of Ukraine anytime soon. Uh, I think, it, first off, it would face much greater resistance from Ukraine if it did that. It would completely remove the idea of Russian deniability that they still cling to. They deny that they are conducting this war in Ukraine. Uh, it would eliminate any sense of deniability. And finally, it would probably uh, provide a boost to President Poroshenko. Uh, it would probably cause um, Ukrainians to rally around him to help defend uh, the country again, which is probably the last thing that Russia wants to do right now uh, as Ukraine goes into elections. So I, I'm not convinced that there's a new attack planned. It's just part of the same picture of creating tension, conflict, pressure, and then seeing what happens as a result of that. Uh, you, you mentioned the decision of the ecumenical patriarch Bartolomeo to move in the direction of autocephaly for the Ukrainian Orthodox Church. And I just want to point out there, this would have been inconceivable five years ago. Uh, the only reason that Ukrainians are demanding recognition for their own church from the ecumenical patriarch is because of Russia's invasion and occupation of the territory and killing Ukrainians. And a situation where the, the J Russian Orthodox Church is blessing the tanks before they go into war against Ukraine has just alienated the Ukrainian people. And uh, I don't know that Russia fully understands just what impact it has had on the mentality and the psyche of, of Ukrainians. Uh, Ultimately, it appears as though this is moving forward and you're now seeing a, uh, a growing contest between the Russian Orthodox Church and the rest of Orthodoxy. And uh, I hope that that is something that uh, plays out as a standoff, but, but not leading to any uh, serious protests or violence in any country. Thank you, Kurt. Uh, the question and the next agenda. Yeah. Uh, Elaine Sereo, Associate Rector for UACU. And I my question is this, uh, both Mr. Uh, Polk and, and Ambassador Volker, what do you see can be done more to upstep this uh, civil society in its role in s moving forward and energizing the nation, uh, and Ukraine of course, uh, in this whole, in the whole st position, in other words moving it forward to a position where you have a whole nation, strong voices, focused to which allows uh, resolutions to move, to be, a, you know, to move forward. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Mm. Maybe you're going to Okay. Uh, uh, well, uh, we, we, we saw a new development in Ukraine after the second Maidan. And that was that people who mobilized on, on the Maidan then decided not to leave and went into politics. And that's where the hope is. That wasn't the case after the Orange Revolution of 2004. Then people elected the, the miracle maker called President Yushchenko, left all the government business to him and went back home. Now they refused to uh, demobilize and again this is this is a great hope the the rise of volunteer movement when the government was not able to mm, supply the army is 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 another example of this civil society really coming coming to the fore 
but it's four or five years now. The resources are not there anymore. The, the enthusiasm is fading and so on and so forth. And the uh, old bureaucracy and, and the old ways of doing things remain to be actually stronger than, than people expected four or five years ago. Uh, but those people are still there. They, they, they didn't go back home. Their morale is maybe not as, as, as great as, as it used to be. So now what, what uh, I don't know exactly how to do that, but I, I think that this is very important for the West actually to, to uh, recommit itself to working with those groups and with those people, uh, both on the, on the um, resource level, but also, but also morally and, and, and otherwise. Because again, this is a new phenomenon that wasn't there four or five years ago, like many other things in, in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Can I just add, uh, yeah, Ukraine sure. already has a very strong, very engaged, very vibrant civil society. It's really impressive. Um, you compare that to many of our allies in Central and Eastern Europe, and there's a greater richness of civil society in Ukraine. Uh, what you don't have are easy transmission mechanisms between ideas and um, uh, activism and, and mobilization of civil society and political leadership. And I think getting political leaders to be more open to engaging civil society, picking up ideas and leading uh, in that way uh, is something that I think Ukraine should really strive for. Thank you. Please. Thank you. I'm Greg Kankowski, Hudson Institute, uh, District Attorney. Ambassador Walker, you justly noted that people in Kremlin still have some illusions uh, of possible uh, readjustment of Trump administration uh, policy in Ukraine. It's evidently these illusions uh, are connected with uh, number six uh, elections. Uh, don't you expect that uh, after number six, then most probably these illusions and hopes of big, so-called big deal with the United States will be broken up, broken down? They take more aggressive uh, posture especially in uh, involvement in uh, Ukrainian election through different uh, active name Thank you. Thank you. Okay, well, two different, th well, maybe three points. So one of them is it's very important to be clear that there is a stronger consensus in the United States about policy toward Russia and Ukraine than there has been for the last 20 years, uh, two well, 15, 18 years, something like that. Maybe 2002 would have been the last point <laughs> where we really had that, so uh, 16 years. Um, but when you look now at, for instance, the Senate, and you have any vote concerning Russia, sanctions, human rights, etc., you have 98 senators lining up. Uh, this is a big change uh, uh, from where we were even during the Obama administration where um, the Obama administration was largely pursuing a reset with Russia and Republicans were skeptical. Um, now you have uh, President Trump, who the Democrats don't like, so they've gone against him and joined Republicans in the Senate to take a hard line view on Russia. Uh, so you have a very strong consensus in the U.S. now. No matter what happens in the November 6th election, what party's up, what party's down, it's not going to change views on how to deal with Russia or how to deal with Ukraine and so forth. So. I think that's clear, and that was embedded in your question. Uh, how Russia responds to that? Uh, I don't think that there's anything for Russia to gain by new aggression. Uh, I think it's only going to hurt Russia more. So I would be surprised if that's the route that they go. When you talk about elections, I think Russia is going to do everything it can to meddle in Ukrainian elections as it is. They're not waiting for November 6th for that. Uh, they are uh, determined to try to influence elections uh, in whatever way they can. And this is one of the ironies of Russia's occupation of the Donbass as well, is they have a lot of tools in their toolbox that they can use. The propaganda, disinformation, uh, corruption, bribery, legitimate business deals, energy, etc. And cyber attacks and even election manipulation and party financing. They can do all of that without occupying the Donbass. 
Uh, so <laughs> this, it's ironic that they've chosen at least one tactic here that sets back <laughs> their other efforts. Uh, but uh, we'll see. Uh, I don't think that they see an easy way out of that right now, but they will certainly continue to pursue elections uh, and, and influence in elections no matter what happens here. Thank you. Damon, you wanted to ask? Thank you very much. Damon Wilson here with the Council. I want to back up a little bit from the specifics of where we are with Ukraine and, turn, and come back to the overall context of our, of our meeting today and take off your special negotiator <laughs> hat and put on your strategic hat. I mean, part of what we're trying to think through, you know, if you think about what the Captive Nations theme did during the Cold War, it, it gave a way for Americans to imagine one of these countries were actually nations, had identity, and that there was an implication of, of, of ultimate liberation um, to call out the egregious behavior from Moscow. If you think about post-Cold War, we had groups like the, the Vilnius 10, it almost created the sense of inevitability that a vast swath of Central Europe would rejoin Europe. It would take time, there'd be process, but there was inevitability. Even today when you think about the Western Balkans, we still have the Thessaloniki Declaration. We've won the strategic argument that the Western Balkans are gonna be part of Europe. Now it's messy, it'll take time. What we're looking at here in Europe's east is not just Ukraine, Georgia, and Moldova one-offs, but it's one of strategic imagination. Is there a way, as what we're trying to think about, rather than looking at the specifics of one or the other, as we talk about this front line of freedom, to begin to help folks in the West to understand not the specifics of Poroshenko's policies or what's happening in Tbilisi or even Messi or Moldova, but to begin to imagine that this is a region, as Wes Mitchell has said already, that already is, is considered and can be part of the West, but it has a, a more direct pathway to be part of the institutions of the West over time. How, how can working with this region almost together in a, in a way that brings particularly those, those three nations together, do we begin to change the imagination of what's possible if they continue to do right things on the ground? And so I just want to elevate it up from mm -hmm. Ukraine to see how do we think about this whole frontier yeah. of freedom and that it, it actually has a pathway forward in a way that we got ourselves to imagine that for Central Europe. We got ourselves, even there, we're there essentially with the Western Balkans. The political elites are not there uh, with Europe. Right. If I, can I yeah. jump on that? Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> but Damon, you make, a, you make a good point and you have a good structural idea. But I think there's a big obstacle before you get to that which is we need to remind ourselves in the West who we are, um, what we stand for, what our societies are about. Uh, right now we face in just about every country a crisis of, um, of identity or confidence in our identity as to what we are. Um, we should be about freedom, democracy, market economy, rule of law, respect for human rights, human dignity, and that should apply for everybody. That it's a universal set of concepts and values, not a nationalist driven, an identity driven set of values. And unfortunately, we have major political movements in just about every country that are ignoring the universality of core values and focusing on the primacy of identity, blood, soil, nationalism, religion, whatever it is. As long as we are doing that, we are not the West that everyone else seeks to join, and we don't have the imagination to see why would it be good if they did. Uh, so I, I think we need uh, a lot of effort to remind ourselves uh, who we are and, and what, we, what our systems and our values uh, really are. Uh, I will make a, a, an advertisement now, too, <laughs> um, next year. Uh, 2019 will be the 30th anniversary of everything that happened in 1989 and uh, that's a lot <laughs> so I think it is uh, a, a project that everybody should adopt and I'm working on at least one way to adopt this of reminding both the events that took place uh, the hopes the aspirations there's a lot of 
video footage and news from the time that can be rewatched. There are people who were active at the time who can still be spoken with and, and hear. Now, what is it that we were all experiencing and we were all fighting for 30 years ago? And what about that, if anything, is wrong today? Nothing, in my view. I think that is the set of values that define uh, what we need to be standing for. We need, we need a big reminder of that. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. And I think that's uh, the right like, uh, point because in my opinion as well, like uh, every country's identity is defined what kind of values they are following. You know, not like uh, I'm a Georgian or Sergei is Ukrainian and we come from the oldest civilization or we have uh, like our independent churches or languages or whatever. But modern world should stand on the same values and to defend these values and uniting the like, uh, uh, forces to, to defend this and to fight against uh, kleptocracy, autocracy, populism, or whatever, nationalists all around the world. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank uh, you. Uh, yeah. May I add a few ah, words? Sorry, yeah. sorry. Yeah, it's okay. Well, oh, uh, I, I uh, uh, continue on what, what Ambassador Walker just said. I think that Ukraine there is also to remind about all those values and, and to show that there are people who take them seriously no matter what. Uh, the the uh, revolution in Ukraine was called Revolution of Dignity, but before that, and, and the parallel name is the Euro Revolution. And the inspiration is about joining European Union when nationalism is on the rise, when the European Union has all these problems and issues. And the question is, what is wrong with those Ukrainians? They don't read newspapers, they don't know what is happening in, in Europe. Well, it's about values, it's about this ideal that they went, they went to the streets, and again, that's, that's probably a good reminder that can be also useful here, talking about, about the roots, about, about values. And one more thing is that it's not just about those countries, it's about transformation of the region. Because argument was made more than once that, okay, if, if Ukrainian society transforms itself, that sends extremely powerful signal to, to Russia and the entire post-Soviet post space as a whole because of so much historically, mentally and otherwise is in common. So, uh, and this, this both things are much bigger than just one individual country or, or the region that we are talking about today. Just wonderful. Quick, quick response. <laughs> um, if this is work, quick response. Because I think we need to keep in mind the West is about nations and freedom. What we're dealing with, Putin has claimed the mantle of nationalism, and yet what we dealt with in the Cold War and today was imperialism, subjugation and repression of nations. It was standing by identity and nations combined with freedom that built the West. And I think that's, that's where we, there's a, an element for us to not cede that argument. Um, and ironically, Putin's taking the mantle of nationalism when actually what we're trying to do is stand by Ukraine as a nation, Georgia mm -hmm. as a nation that is free at home and free to determine its future. And it's the combination of the two which make the West. And I think we sometimes cede that point and we need to own that point, I think. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Thank you. Last question. Last question. <laughs> From the Ariel Cohen, the Atlantic Council. Uh, I uh, couldn't agree more with what just Damon said about the ideas of freedom and the national interest, etc. My question is, if in a scenario where Russia is drastically increasing the use of force in the former Soviet area, be it Ukraine or Georgia or elsewhere, to what extent do you think, um, Ambassador Volker, uh, and to what extent the other two panelists think, the United States and NATO will be capable of answering such a challenge with force. Yeah. Is the current administration committed to that particular area beyond the borders of NATO? And is the, for the current administration is committed to go to war over Montenegro or Macedonia? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Last that's, that's, a, that's a hugely important question, though. Uh, first thing, you use the word capability. Uh, there is no question that the United States and NATO as a whole have the capability. It is, uh, we, we have it hands down. We have the capability to defend <coughs> allies as needed. Uh, the real question that you're asking is will. 
will we do it? And do we have the will to do it? Uh, and here, uh, the reality is that you are never 100% sure until it's tested. It needs to be tested. I believe that if tested, whether it's President Trump, Secretary Mattis, Secretary Pompeo, I, I know all of them personally, John Bolton, uh, I am quite confident that if tested, they will not fail the test. Uh, they, they understand how important it is for the credibility of the United States and security in the world to not let a war get out of hand, that we, we have to be able um, to defend our allies. Y you threw Montenegro and Macedonia together. Um, Montenegro, for sure, it is a NATO ally. Uh, we won't let that line be crossed. Uh, Macedonia and other countries that are not members of NATO, it's more ambiguous. And I think um, you have a situation where the United States expresses interest and concern about the security of members. But it's going to be a much harder lift for NATO uh, to have a consolidated response. If it's Article 5 and NATO membership, uh, I'm quite confident not only in the U.S. but also in NATO decision making as well. Uh, individual allies, as much as we complain about them uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, nonetheless will stand by Article 5 if it's tested. Sergei, you want to add something briefly? Oh, uh, as a historian, I just want to say that the war today is not what it used to be. There are so many definitions, hybrid war, and e even what we are having today in Ukraine is a hybrid war. So uh, I would, my answer would, it depends on what war we have in mind and what war is <laughs> happening. Thank you so much. I would love to use my, like, uh, this opportunity and to thank you all freedom fi uh, fighters in the world, especially the Kurt Walker Atlantic Council, Damon Wilson and other our friends in the Atlantic Council and other organizations as well to uh, supporting our countries for our freedom and independence and uh, liberty and uh, hope we're going to succeed in this battle because we, I believe that we stand for uh, right values. And uh, thank you so much again and it's an organizational announcement that we're going to have a, like a 15 minutes coffee break and 11 o'clock we're going to come back. For <laughs> <the> <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs>